taking something that's like alcohol. No way. Can't happen. Can't happen. Okay? Because we are equally positive that once he takes any alcohol, whatever, into his system, something happens. Well, what happens? Doctor's opinion tells you. You've got an obsession of the mind coupled with an allergy to body. And as soon as you put the alcohol in your system, you set off the allergy, which manifests itself in the craving, and you're going to have another one. 100% abstinence. has to occur that way. Uh, let's go to page 33. Page 33. First paragraph on the top of page 33. First paragraph, top of page 33, about halfway through. It starts with a quote, Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Commencing to drink after a period of sobriety, we are in a short time as bad as ever. If we are planning, if, got that, got that word again? If we are planning to stop drinking, there must be no reservation, no reservation of any kind. That's 100%. Nor, nor, just in case you didn't cover it all, nor any lurking notion that somehow, someday, we will be immune to alcohol. Well, that's pretty clear. I mean, it's got to go. It's got to go. All right? Can't be any of those lurking things back here. You know, let's go to page 30. I'll tell you about one of those lurking things. Page 30. Page 30. You all know what the first step in recovery is, right? First step in recovery? First step in program, you know. First step in a program is we admit that we're powerless over alcohol and our lives will become unmanageable. Here it tells you, here it tells you, page 30, page 30, second paragraph, we learned that we had a fully conceded to our innermost selves that we were alcoholic. This is the first step in recovery. First step in recovery, not the program. That's when it starts to happen, when you admit to yourself. That's 100%. Like they say in Texas, about three inches behind your belly button where you really live, you admit to yourself, you're an alcoholic. All right, first step in recovery. That's when the program starts to happen. Go up above that, up above that in the first paragraph on that page, and you look and you see about halfway through, it says, the idea, the idea, page 30 now, halfway through the first paragraph, the idea that somehow, someday, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. All right? You want to know if you're an alcoholic? Do you think that someday you might be able to control him? Well, let me tell you, I don't know a whole lot of normal drinkers, but they don't like to hang around with me. I mean, they never did. But i got to tell you, if you're worried about your drinking, you're in trouble. Normal drinkers aren't worried about their drinking. You know why? It's just too simple. Because they're not in any problem with the drinking. That's what they're not worried about. So if you're thinking about your drinking, then you're probably an abnormal drinker. All right? And what Bill says is if you've got this idea that somehow, someday, you're going to be able to control this, you know, and I call that football mentality. All my football career, I never got my hands on a football. Played a lot of football. You know, my wife will tell you too much football, not enough helmet. Is that right? That's, you know, played a lot of football, never got my hands on a football. All right? I, I got that football mentality. Just, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Next, I'm going to watch, watch out. You know? Got mud in my teeth. You know what I'm saying? Okay? All right. So what you tell me here? The persistence. Listen to it. Listen to it. The persistence of this illusion is astonishing. Astonishing. The idea that somehow, someday, you're going to be able to drink normally. All right? That's in page, uh, page 30 in that first paragraph. It says, the persistence of this illusion is astonishing. I'm going to tell you a personal story. I stopped drinking. I stopped drinking when my son, my son was like, when my son was seven, seven, something like that. I stopped drinking. Stopped drinking. I don't think my son remembers me drinking. I was 29. Just 29. Past, past week. So I stopped drinking when he was, when he was seven. When, when uh, he was going in junior high, he came to live with Pat and I. Uh, and, 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 and when he was a, a junior in high school, I was still not drinking. And, and because, I, because I was not drinking, we could put him through college. And I told him, you can go to school. We're going to do this for you. And in uh, and, and his junior year, and it came spring, we got in this new truck that I'd gotten, and we went camping for a week, and we stayed in hotels, and we camped, and we went all over Vermont, New Hampshire, and we went looking at the schools that he wanted to go to. And we picked a school, and I would tell you that would not have happened. That was a wonderful thing, a wonderful thing that this program enabled me to do for my son. It was a wonderful thing. It would never happen if I was drinking. And we went up there, and we went for that whole week, and, and, and we had a great time together. And he picked a school, and we got him in that school, and we put him through that school. We paid for it. You know, he's six foot five, and he's a fabulous basketball player, but he wanted to be a skier. 
And I used to buy them like $300 sneakers, say, go on, go on, go on, go, go, go shoot, go shoot, you know. And uh, he wanted to ski. So we ended up paying, we, paid, we invested uh, $60,000 in his college education, and we got a bartender. Uh, he tended bar for seven years. He's now finally, you know, he finally came around and began working at what he went to school for. Uh, thank you, Jesus. Uh, so, but let me tell you the day that we went to his graduation. This was a great day, wonderful day in our lives. You know, we were able to do this, you know. Uh, see, nobody ever gave me nothing. My father died in a bar fight when I was five, and, uh, and he was never around to do these things. And I was able to give this to my son, and I was able to provide him with an education uh, like, like I wish somebody had done for me. And uh, at that graduation day, a fine, fine, wonderful day. I'm standing there, my son, I said to my son, you know, I said, you know, we're not going to hang around too long, you know. So I know it's party time, you know. And we went back to where he was living, and the keg was already there. And the guys were having their beers, and, and, and a thought came to me. Wouldn't it be nice to have a beer with this kid? Oh, whoa, whoa. See, none of this, none of this would have happened if I was drinking. Well, yet my disease got me. Wouldn't it be nice? Just like one of those cold bikes. Wouldn't it be nice to have a beer with this kid? And I said, you know, I said, come on, Pat, I, we got to go. So I went, I went to my son. I said, Eric, I, I got to go. I got to go. And I, he understands. He'd rather have a sober dad than a present dad, you know. So, so we left, you know, we left. Uh, and that's what he's talking about. The persistence of this illusion is astonishing. It's astonishing. It's going to come back when you least expect it. And if you haven't done the work between last time and this time, you're probably going to succumb to it. That's what it's telling You've, unless you've made that 100% commitment. All right? Unless you made that. Let's go to page uh, 42. Page 42. Page 42. It's in the second, it's in the first full paragraph down towards the end. Down towards the end. It says, This process snuffed out the last thicker, flicker of conviction that I could do the job myself. That's 100% commitment. All right? 100%. What page is that? 42. Let's go to page 76. Going too fast? Page 76. It's in, the, it's in the third paragraph in the last sentence. It's in italics. Charlie and Joe tell you that's that little squiggly stuff. It means it's important. It's on page 76, third paragraph, last sentence. Remember, it was agreed that at the beginning that we would go to any length for victory over alcohol. That's 100%. And if you had the sponsor I had, you'd go about 100 miles past any length. Because you were going to do it no matter what. That's page 76. Let's go to page 59. Page 59 in the first paragraph. What does it say? What does it say? Half measures avail us nothing. We stood at the turning point. What's at the turning point? Big sign says you've got to make 100% commitment. That's what's at the turning point. Half measures avail us nothing. Now, I know, I know, if you're a good alcoholic, a drug addict, you're sitting there saying, but, but you said, but you said, half measures avail us nothing. Okay? You said, and, and that's a contradiction because you're telling me we've got to make 100% commitment. All right, let me tell you about something. There's a couple of guarantees in the big book, Alcoholics None. A couple of guarantees. And one of them is in Bob, Dr. Bob's story. If you go to Dr. Bob's story, page 181. Page 181. It says, half measures avail is nothing. Well, let's see. This is a contradiction. Every alcoholic, drug addict I know is into loopholes. No, it's, it's into loophole. Let's run it down. Dr. Bob's story, last paragraph, 181. It says... About halfway through. But if you are, but if you really and truly want to quit drinking liquor for good and all, and sincerely feel that you must have some help, we know that we have an answer for you. It never fails. The guarantee. If, big word, if you go about it with one half the zeal, you have been in the habit of showing when you were, when you were getting another drink. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, Wait a minute, didn't you just tell me half measures of ale is nothing? Now Dr. Bob's telling me, just go about it with half the zeal that you used when you were going to get another drink? Oh, let's put this in a little better perspective. What are we talking about? 
What are we talking about? Here you are, good alcoholic. You just ran out of booze. It's starting to snow. You can't find your shoes. You can't find the keys to the car. But you need to have a drink. All right? Are you going to stay home because you can't find the keys? Because you can't find your shoes? Because you're already drunk? What are you going to do? You don't get yourself a drink. Now, is that a 100% commitment? Or is that a 150% commitment? Or is that a 200% commitment? All right, how about people living, how about people living, in, where do people live? Alamuchi. Wherever the hell that is. You know where that is. People live in Alamuchi. Got to have some heroin. <clears throat> Gotta get to the city. Get to the city. Got no money. Got no money. Train stop running. Started to snow. Got a tornado watch on. You need to drug. What kind of commitment is that? Is that 100%? That's 300. You know? 300. You know, I'm going to get drugged. <laughs> I'm going. You know? So when Dr. Bob is telling you just use half the zeal, what's he telling you? It's about 100%. It's about 100%. You know? That's about what he's talking about. We'll show you another contradiction later on. Also another guarantee. I don't believe it's a contradiction. Let's go to page 12. Page 12 in the fourth paragraph. Page 12 in the fourth paragraph. Is that right? That's not right. No, that's not right. Sorry. Let's go to page 63. 63, second paragraph. Second paragraph. Go down to the last sentence in the second paragraph. We thought well before taking this step, making sure we were ready, that we could at last abandon ourselves utterly to Him. What's another word for utterly? Completely, totally, 100%. Okay? 100%. All right, let's go to page 58. Page 58, third paragraph. Third paragraph, last sentence, third paragraph. Some of us have tried to hold on to our old ideas, and the result was nil until we let go. Absolutely. 100%. 100% commitment. Okay? Uh, 58, 143. 143. We've got some of these in the back of the book. Just proving it to you. Page 143. 143, first full paragraph, last sentence. I don't know why these all occur in the last sentence, but here it is. We all had to place recovery above everything, for without recovery, we would have lost both home and business. If you place recovery above everything, that's 100% commitment to recovery. You got the idea there's more. There's more. I can keep going. I want to get you on to something else. And then we're going to end with that. All right, we'll do some more of these tomorrow. We'll get you on to what's essential to recovery. The things that are essential to recovery. Clearly tells you in the book. The whole list of things right now. We'll go to page 13. I'll tell you some things that are essential to recovery. You know, you folks want to be on a fast track. Got a lot of cocaine addicts in the program these days. They want to get it fast. Good, good, good. Come in there. We got, we got to hurry up here. You know? So here it is. We're just going to eliminate all the bullshit. We're going to tell you just those things that are essential to recovery. There it is. Bottom of page 13. Bottom of page 13. Last sentence down here. It says, Belief in the power of God plus enough willingness, honesty, and humility to establish and maintain a new order of things for the essential requirements. Pretty clear. Pretty clear. Right there. Okay. Down the bottom of page 13. Belief in the power of God plus enough willingness, honesty, and humility to establish and maintain the new order of things for the essential requirements. Alright? These are things that are essential to recovery. Okay? Let's go to page 14. Page 14. Alright, so if we could, we could break down what it says on those pages, but we're not going to do that. Page 14, down the bottom of the page. It says, last sentence, For if an alcoholic failed to perfect and enlarge his spiritual life to work and self-sacrifice for others, he could not survive the certain trials and low spots ahead. All right, now that's essential to recovery right there. All right, it says, it says, for if an alcoholic failed to perfect and enlarge his spiritual life. So it, what do we tell you before? The solution to your problem is a spiritual solution. You have to have this spiritual awakening. So what an alcoholic has to do to recover is to perfect and enlarge his spiritual life. And it also tells you in the same sentence what you, how you do this. Look at what it tells you. If he fails to, uh, to enlarge, perfect and enlarge his spiritual life, how? 
through work and self-sacrifice for others. That's how you perfect and grow your spiritual life. Now, not getting what you need and leaving, which is a lot of people do in our program today, to come here to get what they need and leave. That's half program. That's half program. It's going to work. you got to come here, get what you need, pass it on to somebody else. Some of the greater joys in sobriety are passing what you got on to the next person. All right? And it says there, he could not survive the certain trials in Los Plate. Well, what did Bill Wilson do in that telephone booth out there in Akron, Ohio? You know, he reached out to Dr. Bob because he was afraid of getting drunk. So he stayed, he stayed sober as a result of that. Page 15. Oh, that's the same thing. I'm sorry. That's, that carries over. Page 15. Let's go to page 35. Page 35 in the third paragraph. 35 in the third paragraph. It says, about two or three sentences in, all went well for a time, but he failed to enlarge his spiritual life. All right, now, how do you enlarge your spiritual life? Didn't we just tell you? Back on page 14. What does it tell you at the top of page 14? We're going to have to do some remedial big book here. What does it tell you in about top of page 14? It tells you you maintain... No, tell you, that's the wrong page. i got to go to remedial. Page 15. It tells you you perfect and enlarge your spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others. So, on page 35, it tells you that all went well for a time, but he failed to enlarge his spiritual life. What do you think he did? He stopped helping other people. That's probably what he did. Okay? Let's go to page 20. Page 20. Top of the page. Top of the page. Pretty clear. Pretty clear. Our very lives as ex-problem drinkers depend on our constant thought of others and how we may help meet their needs. Not ours. Their needs. All right? That was on page 20, top of the page. All right, let's go to page 98. 98, first full paragraph, top of page 98. Is that right? 98, paragraph 1. Paragraph 1. Top of the page, paragraph one, last paragraph again. It says, we simply do not stop drinking so long as we place dependence upon other people ahead of dependence upon God. Um, is that right? Next paragraph, last sentence. All right, you're ahead of me. All right, I'm just going to tell you, if Bill thinks something's important, he tells you three times in the book. At least three times in the book. Okay. This is important. Read the next read the next paragraph. Burn the idea into the consciousness of every man that he can get well regardless of anyone. The only condition is that he trusts in God and clean house. Okay? Now that's two. Let's go to page one hundred. Page one hundred actually starts on the bottom of page ninety nine. Here's the third time. Remind the prospect that his recovery is not dependent upon people. It is dependent upon his relationship with God. Three times Three times, two pages. Three times, two pages. Okay? Where else? Essential to recovery. What page is that? All right, let's go to page 100. Page 100. Page 100. In the next paragraph, on page 100, first full paragraph, both you and the new man must walk day by day in the path of spiritual progress. If, if you persist, remarkable things will happen. When we look back, we realize that the things which came to us when we put ourselves in God's hands were better than anything we could have planned. Follow the dictate of a higher power and you will presently live in a new and wonderful world no matter what your present circumstance. That's one of my favorite quotes in the whole book. I'm going to top, top you off tonight with a story about a lady that's in our home group. A lady named Roseanne. She's in our home group, Pat and I. And Roseanne, about four years ago, uh, was diagnosed with liver problems, and she had to get a liver. She had to get a liver, or she was going to die. And uh, she had, a, she had a, a rare rare blood type, so it was hard for her to get a match for a liver. And years went by, and, and she was coming up closer and closer on the list. And uh, within the last year, they gave her a beeper to wear. And she wore this beeper. And when a beeper went off, she was supposed to go to the hospital because that meant they had a liver 
for her transplant. And she was starting to deteriorate at that point in time. And she came to our meeting. Uh, and she started to look bad uh, over a long period of time. She started to look worse and worse and worse. And every time he came, she had that beeper on her, on her waist. And we went out to play golf with her one Sunday. Her and her boyfriend. I sponsored her boyfriend. And we, Pat and I went out to play golf with her. And she said, you know, we can't go too far away to play golf because if this beeper goes off, I have to go right to Beth Israel Hospital. That means they got a liver for him. And I said, honey, you know, if that beaver goes off, I'm going to take you right to the, in the goddamn cart. I'm going to take you right in the golf cart to Beth Israel Hospital. So don't you worry about it. You know. And uh, the beaver never went off. And uh, one night we're sitting in our meeting, Friday night meeting, Sparta, New Jersey. And uh, Roseanne came in and she said that, uh, that she had some bad news. The bad news was that that day they had a liver for her. And her beeper malfunctioned. And she said, she said, I know that God did not want me to have that liver. So he will take care of it. And I'm reading in the book here, it says, Follow the dictates of a higher power and you will presently live in a new and wonderful world, no matter what your present circumstances. And I'm going to tell you, that was Friday night one week, after a year wearing a beeper, walking around afraid she was going to die, and not getting a liver, Saturday of the next week, the beaver went off and she got a liver. And I'm going to tell you it's because she lived what was in this book right here. She made that 100% commitment that this book is talking about right on that line. She's still walking and talking. In fact, she got married in April in Hawaii. She's getting everything she was waiting for. <laughs> Old Robin's working his, and we're, you know, working like crazy. She's getting everything... You know, and what God's got in mind for us, I tell people when they're new in the program, make a list. Make a list of what you're willing to settle for. You know, you're sober 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, make a list of what you're willing to settle for. What do you take right now? Right now. You know, a lot of guys I sponsor, I sponsor, they make a list, top of the list that says, I'd like to get back in the big bed. So they're sleeping on the couch. You know, they're sleeping in the car. I'd like to get back in the big bed. I'd like to have all my bills paid. And I tell people, make that list. Because I'm going to tell you, when you're sober 20 years, you're going to have more than what's on that list. Mm -hmm. You just do what God tells you. You just do what's in this book, and you will have more things in your life. I have things in my life that I wouldn't have put on the list to begin with. Peace of mind. I didn't think about peace of mind. You know, I know about peace of mind. Big timers like me, gamblers like me, you know, guys that are out there promoting, you know, you don't think about peace of mind. Peace of mind. Coal miners get peace of mind. You know, farmers get peace of mind. Not me. You don't get peace of mind. Peace of mind on top of the list today, you know. So, we're going to do a little more of this tomorrow morning. Then we're going to start hammering the book, Doctor's Opinion, take you through the steps. By the time you leave, you're going to know more than most people and alcoholics know about, Alcoholics Anonymous know about the big book. That's it for tonight. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Fred, and I'm an alcoholic. Through the grace of God and the fellowship, Alcoholics Anonymous and strong sponsors, I've been sober since January 21st, 1976. That's a custom in my group, and I'd have to make a commercial before we start. We have tapes. The gentleman at the right, Glenn K. Audio, Frank M., uh, are here. Uh, they're making tapes of a big book study today. And if you want these tapes, um, you have to order by noontime. You can take away the whole set with you, and uh, you just sign up with that gentleman over there. He also has a number of other tapes, which I'll recommend most everything that's on that table over there. I love Milt. If you like Milt, if you want to laugh, he's a great guy to get. Charlie and Joe's tapes are also over there. They are the guys that started this whole deal. Uh, and Charlie and Joe, just to fill in while people are moving around, Charlie and Joe have been doing this, I can't even guess how many years. And they do it free. Uh, so there's no, there's no charge when they go out to an area and do a big book study. Uh, people that invite them in only pay their expenses. And the tapes, you can make yourself uh, very much aware of the big book in the old-fashioned way by getting the tapes from Glenn Kay uh, and studying them. I got a 45-minute 40, 40 uh, drive to work, so I always have tapes in my car. I've worked through several sets of Charlie and Joe tapes uh, just teaching myself how to do this deal. So... I suggest you do that. Uh, do you have the old Charlie and Joe? Old Joe? Yeah, I have them too. So 
Uh, Charlie and Joe came from Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Charlie uh, is a, a white guy. Old Joe is a black guy. New Joe is an American Indian. All right? And as I understand it, Old Joe sponsored the American Indian guy. So there's been a continuity of sponsorship there. And uh, whatever pair you've got over there, Charlie and Joe's, those are, those are the guys. So last night we talked about uh, some history. We talked about how the book's organized. And if anybody wasn't here last night, you need to have one of these sheets. I know some, I see some people winning. There you are. Uh, if you didn't get one, come and get one. Just show you a little bit how the book's organized. We got them up front. We talked about a number of things last night uh, that I'm not going to go back through today uh, because you have to buy the tapes if you want to hear what happened last night. <laughs> so, uh, but we're going to start doing this morning what we left off doing last night. And what we left off doing last night, well, first of all, some of you weren't here. I want to read to you again, page 177 in the 12 and 12. Page 177. And today, if we get enough time, we're going to bounce you back between the 12 and 12 in the big book. All right, same guy, same guy, 15 years difference in time, uh, writing a book. So uh, we're going to bounce back and forth. But on page 177, at the bottom of the first full paragraph, this is our inspiration here. Since recovery from alcoholism, last sentence, since recovery from alcoholism is life itself to us, it is imperative that we preserve in full strength our means of survival. Now, preserving in full strength means we don't dilute it, we don't change it. Okay, we preserve it just the way it was written, just the way it was written in the original big book, the way Bill, the way Bill put it down in the original big book. So it is imperative. All right? Uh, I usually have a dictionary around when I do this, but uh, you can define the word imperative. It's absolutely important, necessary uh, that we do this. So... It's our means of survival. It's imperative that we preserve it in its entirety, just the way it was written. Now, I'm going to point out to you that the way it was written in this book is the same way it was written in the, front of, uh, in the book that you've got in front of you. It may look a little different because that's the way the original book looked. And in the original book, it was a big book, and we talked about it last night. They made it big so it looked like it was a good deal, and uh, alcoholics would buy it because they thought they were getting the deal. But you'll notice if you match this book up, to the book you got in your hand, it does appear to be different. And the reason it does appear to be different is that the doctor's opinion in the front of this book is included in the uh, Arabic numbers. So the doctor's opinion is on page one in the original version. And what happened in the second edition is they moved the doctor's opinion forward. So it's not in the Arabic numbers. So the numbers of pages in this original book do not correspond to the second, third, and uh, the fourth edition as it goes along. All right, that's important because later on we'll talk to you about how some of those things happen. But you'll notice that. And then what Bill, what I understand is Bill Wilson thought in the second edition that anything in the Arabic numbered pages should be written by alcoholics. And Dr. Silkworth, uh, who we've got pictures of up here, Dr. Silkworth uh, is the guy who wrote the doctor's opinion. So he thought since Dr. Silkworth is not an alcoholic, uh, he would move it to the forward, to the front position in the book. Okay? Now, you also notice in this book, in the original version, that Dr. Silkworth did not sign his name. So that's another difference you're going to see. And the reason for that was he was touting some things about Alcoholics Anonymous that would be contrary to what the medical profession believes. And this is my opinion. I need to tell you what it's in my opinion. Uh, he was touting some views that he thought maybe the American Medical Association wouldn't believe uh, or wouldn't agree with, uh, so he, si he did not sign his name, okay? So that's a difference you'll also see. Uh, I think he was right, uh, and also probably one of the reasons was if you did what he was talking about in the uh, doctor's opinion, you probably didn't need to go to a doctor. So that meant that his colleagues wouldn't be making any money, so, you know, he said, better if I don't sign this, okay? So last night we were talking about uh, some of the things that are important in a book we talked about making a 100% commitment. We talked about things that are essential to recovery. We talked about what you will find in the big book. And we're going to bounce around a little bit to get started this morning. Uh, we're going to start talking about something that you'll find on page 40. 
40. It's something what the old guys talked about uh, when uh, when they went out uh, to do a 12 step 12 step call. Okay, and it's a uh, it's a term that I like to make everybody familiar with because you probably experienced it. It's a term called uh, subtle insanity, and they call it by a few different names in the book, but basically it's that term. And that's what we're going to find out about. What the, what the old-timers did when they went and made a 12-step call is they told these guys, they told them about themselves, what happened to them, uh, and they made sure they told them about this subtle insanity. All right, Page 40 in that second paragraph, it says, I was much impressed with what you fellas said about alcoholism. Oh, and by the way, by the way, this starts on page 39, and it's Fred's story. All right, now I, I love this because this could be me. Uh, and in fact, you know, I was doing one of these studies, and, and uh, a newcomer said, you know, is that really you? You know, well, I don't know how bad I look today, but uh, I don't qualify to be in the book. You know, it was written in 39, I was born in 42, so. Uh, but anyway, you know, we said, well, later on we'll clear a spot and we'll let you land, pal. You know, you come off of those, those pills they got down, you'll be all right. So, page 40, second paragraph. I was much impressed with what you fellows said about alcoholism, and I frankly did not believe it would be possible for me to drink again. I rather appreciate your ideas about the subtle insanity which precedes the first drink. But I was confident it would not happen to me after what I had learned. Now, the book tells you a couple places here about uh, people getting self-knowledge and beginning to understand themselves, uh, but it's not enough to stay sober, Okay. And I don't know if you've experienced it, but I've seen people say, well, I, 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 I've learned, I, I, know, I know what the problem is. I've learned, I know, I learned, I learned my lesson this time, you know. And what Bill tells you in the book is self-knowledge is not enough. It's not enough because this subtle insanity is going to creep in. And you all know what that subtle insanity is. You know, that's that, that little thought that's in the back of your mind that says, this time it'll be different. Now, you say, come on, how long are you still? You're six months, come on. You can do, you know, look, come on, you know. And in my mind, I got this subtle insanity that, that it's, like, it's like those guys, you know, you know those guys, those, those uh, Revolutionary War guys with the, the fife and drum corps, you know, uh, the guy with the drum and the, and the flag and they're marching and, and they start coming out of the back of my mind and they say, come on, Fred, what kind of man are you? You know, follow me, men, come on, you know. And, and uh, you deserve a drink. You've been working all week. Come on, you know. And then the battle hymn of the Republic starts playing in the background, you know. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, come on, men. Let's go to the bar. That's the subtle insanity, okay? That's the way it happens with me. Now, this is not new. This is going on when these guys wrote the book, 1935, 1937. Uh, so we all got it. You need to go to school on yourself and figure out where it is in you. You know, what are those sound, what does it sound like in you? Let's go over to page 41. We'll find out. See, Fred's Fred story, who starts on page 39, is back in the hospital detoxing again after Bill and Bob went to talk to him. Okay? Uh, and they went and talked to him and told him the whole deal. They told him about the subtle insanity, what happened to them. But he still went out and picked up a drink. Okay? Actually, let's start down at the bottom of page 40. See if, you can, see if you can read. You know, when you read the big book, you're supposed to read the black part, not the white part. But sometimes... You know, I like to read in between the lines because there's information there. And it's down at the bottom of page 40. It says, In this frame of mind, I went about my business, and for a time, all was well. I had no trouble refusing drinks and began to wonder if I had been making too much, too hard work of a simple matter. Sound familiar? One day, I went to Washington to present some accounting evidence to a government bureau. Think about it. Think about it. What kind of government bureaus are there in Washington where you'd have to bring some accounting evidence? IRS. Sounds good to me. You know, if that Fred's like this Fred, that's exactly where he went. I had been out of town before this particular dry uh, before, during this particular dry spell, so there was not, nothing new about that. Physically, I felt fine. Neither did I have any pressing problems or worries. My business came off well. I was pleased and knew my partners would be too. It was the end of a perfect day, not a cloud on the horizon. All right? Now, here it is. Here it is. 
I went to my hotel and leisurely dressed for dinner. Here it comes. Watch out. Watch out. As I crossed the threshold of the dining room, the thought came to mind that it would be... Listen to me. Listen to me. The thought came to mind that it would be nice. It would be nice to have a couple of cocktails with dinner. That was all, nothing more. I ordered a cocktail in my meal, then I ordered another cocktail. Well, of course. Didn't we teach you that last night? What happens when the obsession of the mind gets you to pick up the first drink and you take the first drink to set off the compulsion, which is evidenced by craving, so you have one, you're going to have another. Okay? After dinner, I decided to take a walk, probably to convince himself that he really wasn't an alcoholic and that he could walk away after two drinks. All right, when I returned to the hotel, it struck me a highball, listen to me, listen to me, a highball would be fine. A highball would be fine before going to bed. Now, I don't know about your drinking, but my drinking cannot be classified as nice and fine. Okay? Those are two words that the Florida Police Department never applied to my drinking. They said, well, he was a fine drunk. He was very nice when we arrested him. That never uh, occurred in any record. Okay? <laughs> Listen to me. Here it goes. When I returned to the hotel, it struck me a highball would be fine before going to bed, so I stepped into the bar and had one. What's the problem here? He had one. What happens when you have one? Craving takes over. I remember having several more that night and plenty the next morning. I had a shadowy recollection of being on an airplane bound for New York and of finding a friendly taxi cab driver at the landing field, listen to me, instead of my wife. The driver escorted me about for several days. I knew little of where I went and what I said and did, and then came to the hospital with unbearable mental suffering, physical suffering. All right? Subtle insanity. Describe right there. Let's go to page 35. Page 35. Top of the page top of the page. It says, So we shall describe some of the mental states that precede a relapse into drinking. And that's what they're about to do, as we just described with Fred on page 39. They describe some of the mental states that precede your relapse into drinking. So, what is it telling us? It's telling me that I'm drunk in my head before I pick up the drink. That's what it's telling us. i got to get to that point in my mind where I may as well be drinking. And if I may as well be drinking, I'm going to be drinking. Okay? Now, people get, in our program, they get, in my opinion, they get to that point where they may as well be drinking because they don't do the work that's contained in this book that gets them to a point where drinking, drinking is no longer an option. So they choose not to do the work because they want to stay sober on their wits. They want to stay sober because of the fellowship. They want to stay sober because they got a good sponsor. Now, I was one of those guys that picked a sponsor. I want to get, I got one of those sponsors. I got one of those, ooh, sponsors. You know, those, ooh, sponsors? You know, when people say to you, you know, well, who's your sponsor? Say, Jack Brady. Ooh. <laughs> you know? So I got sponsors. I, got, I figured I would get sober just by having a good sponsor. And you know what? I was right. You know why people said, ooh, when you said Jack? Because Jack made you do the work that was in the book. And there was no BSing around with Jack. Jack was not one of those cover your ass sponsors. That's what we get today in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, you go to some place and they tell you you got to get a sponsor, so, so you go out and you get a sponsor. Now, what you get is, being a good alcoholic and drug addict, you go out there and you get Cover Your Ass Sponsor. And Cover Your Ass Sponsor is one of those sponsors that sponsor name only. People say, you got a sponsor? You say, yes. They say, who is it? And you tell them, they say, I never heard of him. You want to get sober? Go out and get a hmm, sponsor. All right? Sponsor, when people say, when you say that person's name, they say, oh, oh. You know, you know why they say that? Because they probably never asked that guy to be their son. Because you're going to work. You're going to work. I was just telling Frank before that, that I, I found out the other night why I stayed sober. Why I stayed Nobody's more, I'm sober 22 years. Nobody's more surprised than I am that I'm sober 22 years. Well, maybe there are. <laughs> maybe there are. Uh, my ex-wife's probably you know, surprised. But, uh, a couple of judges and, and some attorneys and that. But, uh, but anyway, I'm surprised. And I, and I found out last Sunday night why I stayed sober. I found out. Somebody, a speaker at a meeting told me why I stayed sober. He said that his sponsor uh, uh, kept him sober. His sponsor told him exactly what to do and when to do it. Therefore, 
he did not have to make any decisions in early sobriety uh, because in early sobriety he wasn't capable of making any decisions. So his sponsor told him, you will call me Tuesday night at 8 o'clock. And since he knew that he had to call the sponsor on Tuesday night at 8 o'clock, he called the sponsor Tuesday night at 8 o'clock because that's when he was told to do it. You see, he didn't have to wonder all week, when am I going to call my sponsor? So he had a time to do it. And I realized that my sponsor told me, you will make coffee on Sunday, uh, Monday night meeting and you'll be there at 6.30. So all week long, I didn't have to figure out, well, when should I go to a meeting Monday night? What time should I get there? I had to be there at 6.30. My sponsor told me exactly what to do. And by doing that, we avoided, avoided this subtle insanity which creeps in. All right, we're going to go to page, uh, did we go to page 35? Yeah, we did that, right? How about page 23? Page 23, the first full paragraph. It tells you. It tells you. First full paragraph, about a sentence in. Therefore, the main problem with the alcoholic centers in his mind, not in his body. The main problem with the alcoholic centers in his mind. Now, is that true? That's only true about alcoholics, right? That don't apply to drug addicts. Can you help me with that? That don't apply to drug addicts, only alcoholics. Drug addicts got other issues. Don't they have other issues? Is that right? All right, so, you know, once you get clean sober, you never have another mental compulsion, craving. That goes, just goes away, all right? That's what they're talking about. Therefore, the main problem with the alcoholic centers in his mind. Think about it. Think about it. You're trusting a sick mind to get you well. If you don't have a sponsor, if you don't have a sponsor that knows the deal, you're trusting a sick mind, your sick mind, with another sick mind to get you well. Okay? Ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen. You cannot heal, heal a sick mind with a sick mind. All right? Let's see. Where else? That was 23. Let's go to page 24. Page 24. In that italics writing, it says, The fact is that most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice in drink. Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We are unable at certain times to bring in our consciousness with sufficient force the memory of the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. How about last night? We are without defense against the first drink. This is that same mind that you're counting on to keep your life on a straight and narrow. And you can't even remember the bad stuff that happened to you previously. You know, we call that euphoric recall in alcoholism. You know, we only remember... Euphoric recall is a naturally occurring thing in human beings. Naturally occurs. Uh, people, uh, people, unless you're clinically depressed, which I don't know if you are or not, but I know there's a lot of people that think they are and are not, because depression is a symptom of early recovery in alcoholism. Think about it. You just got separated from your best friend. All right, alcohol, Jim Bean, my buddy Jim, just got separated from him. Just if I was separated from my best friend, I'd be depressed, okay? But here's what's going on here. It says we cannot remember it. And euphoric recall helps us, helps us to remember naturally that only the good times that occur, only the good times that relate to drinking, it's a naturally occurring thing. I'm going to explain it to you. Now, I'm used to teaching men, so I'm going to explain it to you the way I tell my men. All right? The way I tell my men is euphoric recall is a naturally occurring thing in human beings. However, women have it. Women have it. It's, it's what allows a woman to have sex after she's had a baby. You have it, you see? So if you block out the pain of childbirth in favor of the pleasure of sex, it's not naturally occurring. People have it. Alcoholics and drug addicts got it to an extreme. Because we can block out car crashes, you know, killing people, losing our house, our wife, the car, the kids, the dogs, and, and in favor of having the next drink. We also call it selective perception. We only allow in. Selective perception. We only allow in those things that already verify what you believe. Selective perception. Can't even see the other stuff. Can't even see. You know, people say to us, can't you see? What's the answer to that? No. Can't see. That's what this book's about. The book is about opening up your mind so you start to see the thing. You know, you've got to get some distance between you and, the, you and the alcohol so that you begin to see some things. Okay? That's what this book is about. And that subtle insanity is always there saying, it wasn't that bad. It just wasn't that bad. Right. Every alcoholic's got a sliding scale. You know somebody that's worse than you. And you think about that. That subtle insanity kicks in and says, well, yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, well, I have, to, I have to be honest. Well, an alcoholic, a drug addict says to you, I'm going to be honest with you, the next thing following that statement is a lie. Isn't that right? 
I don't know if you ever used that term, but I said that. Well, I'm going to be honest. With you. you know, and while you're saying that, frantically your mind's trying to come up with some bullshit deal that you can sell this person. You know, all right. So your mind says to you, well, you know, you got to be honest. You got to be honest. You were really trash last night. But, big but, big but, Paulie was worse than you. All right. That's the, that's the subtle insanity. Okay, rationalization, justification, whatever you want to call that. All right, let's go to page uh, 30. Did we do 30? First paragraph on page 30? No, we didn't. Page 30. Page 30, we read it last night. It says there, about the middle of the first paragraph, it says, the idea that somehow, someday, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. If you're thinking about whether or not you should control your drinking, your drink is out of control. I mean, it's so simple, we miss it. All right, so there it is. It says, a little further on, my favorite thing, the persistence of this illusion, what illusion? The possibility that you might control your drinking someday. The persistence of this illusion is astonishing. All right? Down the bottom of the page, same page, third paragraph. Third paragraph. It says, all right, we had to learn that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This was the first step in recovery. When you learn to do that, you overcome that subtle insanity. Because there's no more, there's no place for that subtle insanity to exist. All right, you covered it up. All of us felt at times that we were regaining control, but such intervals, usually brief, were inevitably followed by still less control, which led in time to pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. All right. Now I always ask people, especially people I sponsor, to get to get in front of their face, to get in front of their face, tattoo it on your hand. That's what my sponsor used to say. Take your lowest moment in time. Take your lowest moment in time. Tattoo it on your hand so that whenever you want, you can put it right there in front of your face. Now, I don't know how you define it with your life, you know, with that incomp- uh, pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization, but I suggest to you that's a way to define that lowest point in your life. Whatever that is. Because whatever you've got is that lowest point, that point of pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization right now, if you go back out there drinking and drugging, you'll have another point. I will guarantee you that because it's a progressive illness. And you tattoo it on there. You know, I've had guys tell me that it's a, it's a cavity search when they were going to jail. You know, whatever it is for you. Uh, another guy told me it was killing his best friend in an auto wreck. Whatever it is for you. You know, that lowest moment in time. You never have to repeat it, okay, unless you give in to this. All right? It's another way to offset it. Let's go to page 31. Second paragraph, page 31. All right. Main problem with the alcoholic center is in his mind. What goes on in your mind? Page 31, the first paragraph, it says, Despite all we can say, many who are real alcoholics are not going to believe they are in that class. By every form of self-deception and experimentation, they will try to prove themselves exceptions to the rule and therefore non-alcoholics. Well, what do we know about that? What did it tell you previously? It told you previously in the book that if you're trying to prove yourself not an alcoholic, you're probably an alcoholic. You know, how many normal drinkers are out there trying to say, well, tonight I'm going out and prove myself non-alcoholic? They don't even think about it. They go out and have their two drinks and they go home. You know, they have their couple of drinks. You know, I had a guy ask me one time, well, you want to stop for a couple? And I had to qualify that. Well, what do you mean by a couple? You mean a couple of hours? You mean a couple of days? A couple of hundred? You know, what do you mean by a couple? He meant a couple, two drinks. Well, why would I do that? Why would I do that? Okay. All right, stop for a cup, you know, a couple of drinks. So you got two bottles of Jack, maybe. That's a different story, you know. One for you, one for me. So by every form of self-deception and experimentation, self-deception, experimentation, you know. You remember, remember when you had those ideas? Well, what I'll do tonight. They usually come when you're driving alone in a car. All right? When you're driving on a highway, watch the people next to you. You'll see them. You'll see them. Yeah, I think your ears start turning around when they, you know, their eyes light up and they get this red and blue glint. You know? And they come up with an idea. I got it. I got it. Tonight when I go home, I'm going to have a quart of buttermilk before I drink the scotch. That's it. You know? And they go like that. Now, just to show you that that's not new, look down a little further on page 31. There's 18 ways 18 ways listed there that alcoholics that Bill thought about when he was writing this book tried to control their drinking. Here are some of the methods we tried. 
drinking beer only, limiting the number of drinks, never drinking alone, never drinking in the morning, drinking only at home, never having it in the house, never drinking during business hours, drinking only at parties, switching from scotch to brandy, drinking only natural wine. Let me stop there. Like? Like? There are some wines out there that ain't got no grapes in them at all. Right? You know, natural wines like Wild Irish Rose, Night Train, things that come in brown bags and bump in the night, you know? Okay? Natural wines. Now, I happen to grow up when Boone's Farm, Boone's Farm came out. All right? Boone's Farm. And I had my wife, my wife at that time, who was also named Pat, and I suggest that any of you drunks in the audience try to get all your wives named same. You can never get in trouble. Never get in trouble. You know, so uh, my first wife named Pat, she used to drink this natural wine. And she was like one of these hippie dudes, you know, hippie girls that, you know, and uh, she would get our natural wine. And she'd get a natural buzz of her natural wine, you know. Uh, but she'd say, oh, it's, it's, it's raspberry and cinnamon. Oh, man, you know. Uh, so here it is. Here's the rest of them. Agreeing to resign if ever drunk on a job, taking a trip, not taking a trip, swearing off forever. With and without a solemn oath. I grew up in a time when, when a priest came to the house and my father knelt on his knees and the kids held candles and he took a pledge that he would never drink again. Till the following Friday. I didn't know that that was part of the pledge. And we used to have to go out and chase him around and get the pay envelope before he drank it all up. Uh, but they used to do that. Taking more physical exercise, reading inspirational books, going to health farms and, and sanitariums, accepting voluntary commitment to a sanitarium, we could go on with the list out of tonight. Okay? Now, why is that? Because none of those things ever brought in the fact that subtle insanity that says to you, once you pick up a drink, you're off and running, and you're going to do this forever. Okay? Subtle insanity, what's next? We go to page 43. Page 43. Where is it? Down the bottom of the page it says in the last paragraph, the alcoholic at certain times has no effective mental defense against the first drink. That means, what does that mean? The main problem with the alcoholic centers in his mind. Except in a few rare cases, neither he nor any other human being can provide such a defense. Here it comes. I told you last night, the solution to your problem is a, is a spiritual solution. His defense must come. Must. You go to those meetings? You go to those meetings where those people that kill people say, there are no musts in this program. There's a must. It says right here. His defense must come from a higher power. I'm going to suggest something to you. The people that say there are no musts in the program, those people are not working a good program. There's 57 musts in the program. We've got to listen to them up here. We're going to give them to you, tell you where to find them. So next time you see one of those people stay in that meeting say, well, there are... How about this? Each of us works the program in our own way. Well, how come in the book here they call it a whole chapter that says there is a, a, an article denoting, denoting one. There is a solution. Each of us works the program in our own way. There is one way to work the program. It's in the book. I suggest to you that person that's saying that, it means never read the book. And last night we told you that reading the book ain't going to, ain't going to solve your problem. You've got to study the book. It's going to solve your problem. All right? Well, here it is. It says, his defense must come from a higher power. Why must it come from a higher power? Because we just read it previously. It says you're beyond human aid. That's why it must come from a higher power. You're beyond human aid. You can't do it. You can't do it. So it's got to come. You've got to plug in. You've got to plug in to that infinite power source because you yourself are a finite power source and you cannot do this. Okay? Also, you cannot heal a sick mind with a sick mind. So it's a real, real quick and easy right there. All right? I'm going to set that coffee cup down. Ah, what else? Subtle insanity. I got a lot of them. I got a lot of them. Now, have you, have you, let's talk about second step. Second step. Second step is, second step, Came to believe that a power what does it say? Oh, have you been to those meetings? Have you been to those meetings? Those sanity meetings? You should call them sanity hearings. You been to those meetings? People raise their hand. People got time. They raise their hand. They say, they say, 
Well, I know that I was insane when I drank, but, big but, but, I am not insane now. Uh, call the bus, get him out of here. All right? What's Bill talking about? He's talking about the subtle insanity that precedes the first drink. That's what he's talking about. Okay? Is he talking about the crazy shit you did when you were drinking, drugging? He's not talking about that. He's talking about that insanity that occurs, the subtle insanity that occurs before you pick up the drink. Therefore, following the first step, which says, I'm powerless over alcohol, my life is unmanageable, you now got to look at the idea that this is my problem. So what's going to happen before I start drinking is the subtle insanity is going to occur. Insanity. See the word? The subtle insanity is going to kick in. And you're going to need some help to get you out of that mind, out of that, out of that sick mind, which is the main problem with the alcoholic, and back into some kind of sanity in order to, in order to survive. Okay? And what did I tell you in the book? That you're beyond human aid and that it must come. It must come from a power greater than itself. So what's the second step say? That's what it says. Came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. When? Before you pick up the drink. See, let me, maybe you missed this. Maybe you missed this. I'm going to be real kind. Maybe you missed this. The idea is not to drink. That's the idea. See, and, and maybe you missed this part too. Before you don't drink, you stop. So first you stop. Now, I'll go over this and I'll put it on the board if I need to. Here it is. Number one. Stop. <laughs> number two. Stay stop. <laughs> Got it? That's it. That's it. Okay? Now, how do you stay stop when this subtle insanity kicks in? You plug into your higher power. That's how you do it. This is so simple. You miss it. I'm, I got degrees. I got degrees. I got degrees. I got a lot of degrees. I got so many degrees. My sponsor told me, thermometers have degrees. You know what they do with them, don't you? Think about it. Is it too early for that? Too early for that. I got degrees. I know this stuff. He said, you know this stuff. How come you're back for the fourth time? Because I missed it. It's so simple, I missed it. All right? We're talking about the second step here, okay? Let there be no pains and bones about it. I got too many more things to tell you about that subtle insanity, okay? But, 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 I'm not going to do anymore. That's enough. We want to go to the next thing, all right? Subtle insanity. I want to go to the next thing, which, which is, we were talking about uh, promises, promises last night. And the promises to me, the promises to me are what keeps me going, all right? So if you go to page 83 and 84, you know, we get people up at meetings, and uh, I'm a meeting bash. I, I, at least I'm not talking about meetings that you go to. You know what I mean? I talk about meetings that I go to. You know, we get people up at meetings, and it always cracks me up because you get somebody up there, and they say, now here's Ronnie to read the promises. And Ronnie gets up there and reads these promises. Nobody ever tells you where the promises come from. Where, and a select few in Alcoholics Anonymous know that they come from page 83 and page 84. Don't look at the book. What's on page 83 and 84? When do the promises occur? After which step? Okay? After the ninth step. All right? That's what it tells you in the book. After the ninth step. And the promises occur in the book in such a way as to tell you this is how you know if you did that step right. That's what it occur. All right? And some of you weren't here, so I'm going to tell you, last night we told everybody that there's 147 promises in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Old Ronnie gets to get up there and read 12. And then we debate with him whether it's actually 12 or 13. Now, I, I like to really stir the pot and tell him there's actually 14. All right on that page. And actually, there's seven more on that page that nobody ever reads. But let's go to where it says. It says, if we are painstaking about this phase of our development, what phase of our development? Step nine. Step nine. If, big if, remember that word, if, big if, if we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. How do you know? How do you know if you're halfway through your step nine? How do you know? You start to get amazed. It says it right in the book, doesn't it? Come on, you've got to read the book. It says it. 
You'll be amazed before you're halfway through. You're starting to get amazed. You say, holy shit, I must be halfway through my night steps. <laughs> it says it right in the book. I'm not writing this stuff. I'm not making it up. It's there. You know, we're going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. We will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. We will comprehend the word serenity and we will know peace. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how, we can ex- see how our experience can benefit others. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and economic insecurity will leave us. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. We will suddenly realize, here it comes, listen to me, that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. And why? Because you're beyond human aid. That's what it said in the book. Are these extravagant promises? Now you can debate whether it's 12 or 13 in here. Let me really mix you up. You can, you can debate that until we read the next sentence, the next paragraph. Are these extravagant promises? We think not. They are being fulfilled among us, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. My sponsor said, that's where you come in, Fred. You get in the way, it's going to be slowly. You let go and let God, it'll be quickly. Here's the next promise. Tell me whether it's 13 or 14. They will always materialize if, big word, if we work for them. All right? This brings us to step 10. All right, you want some more promises? Want some more promises? Down the bottom of the page. Down the bottom of the page. Here you go again. Down the bottom of the page. And we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. For by this time, listen to me, sanity will have returned. You getting this? Got to work the steps to get to sanity. All right? Just too hard, too difficult. For the, by this time, sanity will have returned. I promise. We will seldom be interested in liquor. If tempted, we recoil from it as from a hot flame. We react sanely and normally. And we will find that it has been automatically, as, that this has been, happened automatically. God took it from me. We will see that our new attitude towards liquor has been given to us without any thought or effort on our part. It just comes. This is the miracle of it. We are not fighting it, neither are we avoiding temptation. We feel as though we have been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. We have not even sworn off. Instead, the problem has been removed. It does not exist for us. We are neither cocky nor are we afraid. This is our experience. This is how we react. So long as, if, all right, so long as, if, we keep in fit spiritual conditions. Now, why is that? Because the solution to our problem is a spiritual solution. We are beyond human aid, so it has to come from a power greater than ourselves. Right on the same page, those people that get up and read the promises don't even read the rest of the goddamn page. All right, more promises. Give you some more. We ain't going to give them all to you. You know why we don't give them all to you? Then you don't have to read the book. So we can't give them all to you. All right? Top of the page on page 87. More promises. Top of the page. What used to be the hunch or the occasional inspiration gradually becomes a working part of the mind. Now, what do we learn? Main problem with the alcoholic centers in his mind. You've got a sick mind. Your mind starts to heal. The occasional inspiration gradually becomes a working part of the mind. I'm starting to get all those valves kicking in. Drop down the last, next to the last sentence in that paragraph. Nevertheless, we find that our thinking will, as time passes, be more and more on the plane of inspiration. That's how God sends you messages. He tells you on the way home, why don't you stop and do this for so-and-so, you know, for somebody else. We come to rely upon it. That's another, that's another promise. More promises, page 63. More promises. Promises occur after every step. After every step. You want to know if you did the step right, then you'll know, I'll tell you how to know if you did it right. All right, how do you know if you're halfway through step nine? Start to get amazed. All right, you're ready. Okay. All right, let's go back to step three. Tell you how to know if you, or step two. You want to know if you did it right? It's at the top of page 63. When we sincerely took such a position, what position? What position? Center field? What position? You go back to page 62. It tells you where God becomes your director. That position. When we sincerely took such a position, all sorts of remarkable things happened. We're talking about step two. We had a new employer being all powerful. He provided what we needed if we kept if we kept close to him and performed his work well. Established on such a footing, we became less and less interested in ourselves, our little prob, our little plans and designs. More and more we became interested in seeing what we could contribute to life. 
as we felt new power flow in, as we enjoyed peace of mind, as we discovered we could face life successfully, as we became conscious of His presence, we began to lose our fear today, tomorrow, and hereafter, we were reborn. Now, if you don't want a piece of that for yourself, you need to get a psyche valve right away. This is the deal right there. And then we go on to what's called the step, the step three prayer, which we'll go through later on. 27 prayers in the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. All right, this is their third step prayer. And if you've got a sponsor and you worked the third step with your, your sponsor and you did not get down on your knees and pray with your sponsor the third step prayer, in my opinion, you did not work third step. I got big guys. I got a, I got a long shoreman that I sponsored named George, great big guy. And uh, I, I had him down in my step dungeon down in the basement of my house. And uh, all my guys I sponsor call it a step dungeon because there, there are men. There are men who have gone down into that step dungeon and not worked their steps and they have never come up out of that step dungeon. <laughs> so I take old George down there and I said, now George, we're coming up on the third step so you've got to get on your knees. He said, no way, man. This ain't happening, you know. I said, well, I'm getting on my knees with you. He said, well, maybe I'll try it. And we joined hands and we said the third step prayer. And that's eight years ago and George never picked up a drink. Now, maybe it worked. You know, it's just a suggestion, but maybe it works. Okay? More promises? I don't know. Can we do more promises? More promises? They always materialize if you work for them, right? Isn't that what we said? I don't know if we'll give you any more promises. Just a couple. Just a couple. Page 152. One fifty two in the second paragraph. More promises. Yes, there is a substitute, and there's vastly more than that. It is the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. There you will find release from care and boredom and worry. Your imagination will be fired. Life will mean something at last. The most satisfactory years of your existence lie ahead. Thus we find the fellowship, and so will you. If you're not interested in that, you need to get yourself checked out very quickly. All right, that's enough promises. Let's talk about let's talk about change. Let's talk about change. And change occurs. Change occurs first on page twenty-five. Twenty-five. Page twenty-five. Change. Well, I'll tell you another promise as long as we're on page twenty-five. Make the least happy anyway. <laughs> it's in the first full paragraph. It's the last sentence. It says, We have found much of heaven, and we have been rocketed into a fourth dimension of existence of which we had, e had not even dreamed, the spiritual plane of existence. That's another promise. Okay? All right, here's about change. In the first paragraph, the first full paragraph, it says, There is a solution. Almost none of us like the self-searching and leveling of our pride the confession of shortcomings which the process requires for its successful consummation. That tells you about Alcoholics Anonymous in, in about a sentence. None of us like the self-searching, the leveling of pride, and the confessions of shortcomings which the process requires. What's the process, by the way? You know what a process is? You can define a process. Process is a series of related activities geared to a specific end. That's process. All right, you want to bake a cake? Change the fender on your car? You know, that's a process. You want to change your life? It's a process. Okay? You can wait and hang around until it happens to you, but it most likely has to be done through a process. So, it says here, here's the process. Here's the process. You need to do some self-searching. You need to level your pride. Leveling your pride. That's what old-timers used to do around the program. And now newcomers don't talk to old-timers old that do that. You know, newcomers don't want to talk to they say because we're not kind enough. You know, when, when uh, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, you got two directions. Two directions. Sit down, shut up. Two directions. Sometimes you got three. Make coffee. Clean up. And today we say we have they have so many other issues. We need to help them. We need to help them. And we go up to people and we say, Well, we have eight thousand meetings in the state of New Jersey. Just keep going to one until you find one you like. You're gonna die. You're gonna die. I was hostile, angry, resentful. I hated people. I didn't like being in here. I don't want to be here. I didn't want to. I don't want to not. I don't want to stop drinking. 
Just keep going to a meeting that you find one you like. My sponsor Jack told me, you'll go to this meeting till you like it. <laughs> and you know what? I liked it. I went to him and said, these people are crazy. He said, you have to go. We had a third step workshop. We had people meditating on, on beams of light coming out of coffee cups. I said, Jack, these people are crazy. He said, you have to go to this meeting so it doesn't matter to you whether you go to the meeting anymore. I said, oh, shit. Now i got to get a new sponsor, you know? Okay? <laughs> All I want to tell you, I did what my sponsor told me. I don't know why, but I did. And I went to that meeting. And at a point in time, Jack said to me, you want to change meetings? I said, no, I like this meeting. What changed? Still the same crazy people at that meeting. But in the process, I changed. You know? And I was getting what I needed out of the meeting. See, you've got to grow where you're planted. Trees, you know, trees grow anywhere, right? You know? But you know where they grow? They grow where they're planted. Trees don't get to say, gee, I really like it over here by that red brick house, you know? You know? They're planted right here. You know, that's it. You know? We do geographic cures, okay? So, what was I going to tell you? I forgot. About change. Okay? Where is it? Change. Here it is in the a, in a, in a second paragraph, a couple of sentences in. It says, the central fact of our lives today is the absolute certainty that our Creator has entered into our hearts and lives in a way uh, which, intent, which is indeed miraculous. That's a change. All right? And I'm going, to tell you, I'm going to tell you that, in my opinion, God doesn't enter your heart. God's already in your heart. What happens is you've covered Him over all these years with all the things you've been doing. You see, I, we, I like to talk about God's God traps, God's jokes. And, and you see, if I was God, I'd be playing a lot of jokes on people, you know. And God, see, God, God, because God's God, cannot give you, He cannot give you, He cannot not give you what you need. He has to give it. He has to give you Him. He has to because He's God. But He's trapped, you see. He's trapped because He has to give you because He's God. He's got to give you God that He's trapped. But He figured it out. He figured it out. He may have been alcoholic. I don't know. But He figured out an angle. He figured out an angle. You know what the angle is? He doesn't tell, have to tell you that you got it. That's the angle. So every human being has exactly what they need to survive, and they've got God inside of them. God has to give you that, but He doesn't have to tell you guys. So we got people climbing mountains, you know, seven years in Tibet and all that stuff, you know, trying to find God. And I think God's sitting up there in his bark all lines are just dying. He said, I love this. I love this. Look at these guys. Look at what they're doing, you know. And you come to Alcoholics Anonymous, and they tell you two things you got to do. Clean house. Find God. Now, that's one thing you've got to do. Because when you clean house, you'll find God as a result of cleaning house. Okay? So he's in there. So it says here, the central fact of our lives today is the absolute certainty that our Creator has entered into our hearts and lives in a way which is indeed miraculous. Well, I don't want to question Bill at all, and I would never do that, but I'm going to tell you what I found is it was already there. I just had to get in touch with what was over there. And I had so much between me uh, when I got it, when I got it, when He gave it to me, and what I did with it in between when I got back to needing it and wanting it in order to survive, that I, that I had to clean that out first. Okay? Uh, page 25. Are we there? We're there. Forget about it. Forget about it. Page 143. 143. 143, it says in the first full paragraph, almost the last sentence, to get over drinking will require a transformation of thought and attitude. We all had to place recovery above everything for without recovery, well, that's it. You know, a transformation of thought and attitude. Okay? That's about it. Now, let me see if I can pull this one out. We didn't write this one down. If not, we're going to catch it when we go through the book. Now, we'll catch it when we go in the book. In the back of the book, on page 569, page 569, you're going to talk, that's in, a, in any book that you got, it's page 569, even a red book. It's not page 569 in the big book, in the red book, but it is page 569. And actually, in the, in, the, in the red book, it occurs just before those gray pages, but it's still five, page 569. And what happened in the, big, in the big book, when Bill wrote it, in the first edition, when Bill wrote it, he talked about this spiritual awakening that he had, and uh, people got excited because they all thought that they ought to have the same kind of spiritual awakening that Bill had. So in the second edition, <coughs> they, they started this appendix, 
in the second edition, and Bill chose to, in the second edition, explain the spiritual experience that he had. So, we're going to read this. We're going to read this. And I'm going to tell you that, you know, we said last night that Bill thinks something's important. He says it at least three times in the big book. At least three times. All right, so you find something you think is important, check it out by checking the book and seeing if it's in there three times. If it's in there at least three times, Bill thinks it's important. All right, I'm going to read you two pages, about a page and a half. How many times does he mention change? The only problem with Bill Wilson is he learned when he went to school that you never use the same word twice. Okay? Create a lot of problems for us with that. So what he does is he says the same thing. He says the same thing, but he says it in a different way. So we're going to read this, and we're going to try to figure out how many times he said change. So here we go. The term spiritual experience and spiritual awakening are used many times in this book. In this book. Which upon careful reading shows the personality change, that's one, sufficient to bring about recovery from alcoholism. Let's stop right there. What's he telling me? If you're going to recover from alcoholism, you've got to change. The personality change that's necessary, uh, the personality change sufficient to bring about recovery from alcoholism has manifested itself among us in different forms. Yet it is true that our first printing gave the readers the impression that the personality changes, that's twice, or religious experiences, that could be three, must be in the nature of sudden and spectacular upheaval, that could be four. Happily for everyone, this conclusion is erroneous. In the first chapters, a new, in the first few chapters, a new, uh, a number of sudden revolutionary changes. How many you got now? All right, revolutionary changes are described. Though it was not our intention to create such an impression, many alcoholics have nevertheless concluded that in order to recover, they must acquire immediate and overwhelming God consciousness change, followed by, followed at once by a vast change in feeling and outlook. Among our rapidly growing membership of thousands of alcoholics, such transformations change, so frequent, are by no means the rule. Most of our experiences are what, are, are what the psychologist William James calls the educational variety because they develop slowly over a period of time. Quite often, friends of the newcomer are aware of the difference long before he is himself. He finally realizes that he has undergone a profound alteration in his reaction to life that such a change could hardly have been brought about by himself alone. Why? Because he's beyond human aid, okay? What often takes place in a few months can seldom have been accomplished by years of self-discipline. With few exceptions, our members find that they have tapped an unsuspected inner resource. If you've tapped an unsuspected inner resource, you've made a change, which they presently identify with their own conception of a power greater than themselves. Most of us think this awareness of a power greater than ourselves is the essence of spiritual experience. Our more religious members call it God consciousness. Most emphatically, we wish to say that any alcoholic capably, capable of honestly facing his problems, if an alcoholic honestly faces his problems, what is that? That's a change. All right? Honestly facing his problems in the light of our experience can recover. What's necessary to recover? That's one of the things we did last night. What's essential to recover? Well, what I learned here, just reading two pages, that I've got to have a personality change. It says personality change is sufficient to bring about recovery. Therefore, personality change is essential to recovery. Then it says to me over here that any alcoholic capable of honestly facing his problems in the light of our experience can recover. So the second thing I learned in two pages how to recover that's absolutely essential to my recovery is that I've got to face my problems, honestly. Provided he does not close his mind to all spiritual concepts, he can recover. Why? Because it's a spiritual solution. He can only be defeated by an attitude of intolerance and belligerent denial. Now, I can tell you three words that characterize belligerent denial. All right? The first one is no, and the last one is wait. You can fill in the middle one. All right? You've got people saying that. If you're saying that yourself, that's belligerent denial. You know? All right, why we find that no one need have difficulty with spirituality of the pro program. Here it comes, Necess uh, essential to recovery. Willingness, honesty, and open-mindedness are the essentials of recovery. How clear is that? Willingness, honesty, and open-mindedness. What is that? That's how, all right? Or who, you know? It depends, all right? Uh, 
Willingness, honesty, and open-mindedness are the essentials of recovery, but these are indispensable. There is a principle, there is a principle which is a bar against all information, which is proof against all arguments, and which cannot fail to keep a man in everlasting ignorance. That principle is contempt prior to investigation. Now, that's attributed to Herbert Spencer, who was a, a 19th century philosopher, I believe. <clears throat> However, I had one of these guys working for me that was a nut, you know, he's on the Internet all the time, and he researched this, and he went out and he tried to find some work that Herbert Spencer wrote that thought in, and he couldn't find any. So we've come to believe that maybe Herbert Spencer was the Herbie Spencer that used to sit next to Bill Wilson in the bar down there next to 182 Clinton Street when they used to talk about how to save the world. So maybe it's not the Herbert Spencer that was the philosopher. So I think uh, we're going to do one more thing and then we're going to take a break and talk about spiritual life. Spiritual life. Spiritual life. And go to page 155. Lines 155 in the second paragraph, about halfway through it, about a third of the way through, it says, A spiritual experience he conceded it was absolutely necessary, but the price seemed, to, seemed high upon the basis suggested. Well, that's another thing that is absolutely necessary if you're going to change. Or if you're going to change, yeah. Or if you're going to survive. Uh, spiritual experience. Okay? Page 35. 35 in the third paragraph. Page 35, third paragraph, it says, in the third paragraph, what does it say? It says he failed to enlarge his spiritual life. All right, we talked about that last night. And if you're going to survive, that's what you've got to do. Page 13, fifth paragraph. All right? Starting to overlap. All right, so we talked last night, we used this, in terms of what's necessary to recovery. All right, but it tells you, here's what's absolutely necessary to bring about spiritual uh, uh, change, spiritual awakening, okay? It says at the bottom of page 13, belief in the last paragraph, last sentence, belief in the power of God. It gives you three things, three things. Belief in the power of God, plus enough willingness, yeah, plus enough humility, or willingness, honesty, and humility to establish and maintain the new order of things for the essentials of recovery. All right? That's going to bring about your spiritual awakening because you're going to recover through you're going to recover through a spiritual awakening, spiritual solution to your problem. Go down to the bottom of page 14. We're going to tell you how to how to how to enlarge your spiritual life. We did it last night as being essential to recovery. It says last sentence on a page where if an alcoholic failed to perfect and enlarge his spiritual life, and how do you perfect and enlarge your spiritual life? through work and self-sacrifice for others, he could not survive the certain trials and low spots ahead. Okay? And where are you? Who is going to remind me? Who is going to remind me about uh, we? I, I want to make sure I got it. All right. Uh, what's your name? Christina told me last night, uh, she asked me, how many times was we in the book? I tell you, we's in the book 1,154 times. You know, here's what goes on in Alcoholics Anonymous. 1,154 times the word we is used in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. Something really interesting has occurred in our, in our society here, in our fellowship. If you look at what's going on in Alcoholics Anonymous, it tells you right here that we, we enlarge our spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others, not us. In my opinion, what I've seen happen in Alcoholics Anonymous is we've gone from a we program to an I program. And if we don't start turning that back around, we ain't going to have a program. But Bill's telling us, not only are you going to fail, but the program's going to fail. I'm going to give you some, some testimony to that. All right, if you look at the first, the forward to the first edition of the big book, and I'm not going to ask you to do it, but if you spend the time like I did, you will count in the forward to the first edition of the big book, the word we is used 18 times. 18 times. All right, 18 times in two pages. 18 times in two pages. All right? First edition of, first edition of the Big Book, 1939. It was written, okay? Uh, 18 times the word we is used in two pages. <clears throat> Forward to the second edition. Written in 1955. 
the word we is used ten times in seven pages. Ten times in seven pages. 1976, third edition. Third edition. Okay? 1976, third edition. And we is used one time in two pages. One time in two pages. Alcoholics Anonymous going from a we program to an I program. And if you don't stop it, if you don't, because now after this big book study, you got the message that people need out there. You got the message that they need out there to save the program. All right? If you don't do something about it, nobody's going to do something about it. And so working with others, it tells you on page 14, bottom of 14 and over into 15 about that. It tells you on page 20 about working with others. It tells you at the top of page 20, our very lives as ex-problem drinkers depend on our constant thought of others and how we may help their needs. Not only your lives, but Alcoholics Anonymous depends on that as well. You go to page 18. Page 18 in the fourth paragraph, it tells you the same thing. Page 18. People went on 12 steps calls years ago. You used to have to get dressed up. You have to get dressed up because when you went and called on a drunk, uh, you want to look good because you want to look like, you know, something that this person would aspire to look like. We've got people coming to meetings, Alcoholics Anonymous, they look, and they're sober some period of time. They don't even look presentable, let alone something that somebody wants to aspire to. So we, we, have, we have softened. We have compromised our principles. You get up to the podium in my group, uh, you've got to wear a shirt and tie. It's required. All right, bottom of page, bottom of page 18. Bottom of eight, page 18, we've got, uh, is that where are you? Where are you? 18, the fourth paragraph. All right, it says, but the ex-problem drinker who has found a solution who is properly armed. Listen to me. Listen to me. But the ex-problem drinker who has found this solution. How many solutions? One solution. This solution. Who is properly armed with facts about himself. You've got to read all these people. You've got to read Gorski. You've got to read all these people that are out there. You've got to read 100 books. You've got to know the latest stuff on the market. What are they telling you? If you're going to make a 12-step call, you're going to work with other people, you better know about yourself. Alcoholics, drug addicts, they know it right away. The guy's a phony. He's a phony. You know? Okay? You know, you don't want that guy. You don't want that guy coming to call on you that knows all those quick things. You know, like, you know, all those AA jargon stuff. You know, um, he does it. You know? <laughs> One day at a time. I'll be back tomorrow. You know? It's like, all right? You want, you want a guy that knows what he's telling you. Right? So armed with facts about himself. Now, why do you need to be armed with facts about yourself? Because that's what the original members did. They went out and told those people what they did, not what he ought to do. The ex-problem drinker who has found this solution and was properly armed with facts about himself can generally win the entire confidence of another alcoholic in a few hours. And you'll have that person doing things that nobody else could get him to do. Until such an understanding is reached, little or nothing can be accomplished. That's working with others. We'll find the right page and do more. All right, let's go to page 70. Page 70. 70 in the second paragraph. Page 70. <laughs> page 70, maybe we should start over in the next page. This is uh, this is it's wrong wrong topic for working with others. Well, I'll tell you what. We'll tell you the story, and then then we'll give you a break because we'll do the whole deal. We'll do the whole deal. All right, page page sixty nine. Page sixty nine. It starts with talking about sex. All right. And later on, when we do when we do our work on the fourth step, we'll, we'll really work on this. But there are those of us that think that Bill Wilson, that Bill Wilson. Uh, played a joke on us and he wrote about sex on page 69. I'm going to tell you that that's not true.